what are we going to learn here we're going to learn introduction to gdp we're going to do this with the idea of learning some terms we want to teach organize economic we want to take out all the frills keep very simple remember that this is not an economics theory course this is not so don't think of this as a broad economic theory course it is not we're going to get a broad outline of what the basic economic terms are specifically this video we're going to focus on gdp and i'm going to give you quite a few uh, starting steps to read more on to get a sense of this um, when i was a student i was heavily intimidated by the jargon and i just didn't get the terms and every term was explained by other terms and so it was a circularity problem so i want to break that i want to make sure that there is all the people who are interested in learning basic ideas no very basics on economics starting with gdp right so let's start off what is gdp gdp is gross domestic product what does it exactly mean the sum value of total goods and services produced in a country in a region right? uh, broadly intuitively it's a parallel for annual salary very often i have students who have a, or people who have a doubt between is it a salary measure or a wealth measure it's a salary measure it's not a wealth measure the people so anyone who is working you want to know how much they earn in a month how much wealth they have gdp is a parallel to how much they earn in a month or a quarter or a year or whatever the time metric is and so it's not a snapshot it's over a period of time you don't have gdp on may 1st you have gdp for a year gdp can be measured in many ways it can be measured in what is called as a income approach or expense approach or the value added approach forget about all that this is the most common approach for measuring gdp and so it's the expense approach the most common approach for measuring gdp and what what goes inside this there are four components to it consumption c investment i government expenditure g x net exports exports minus imports c stands for consumption i for investment g for government expenditure x for net exports exports minus imports now what do these terms more specifically stand for consumption anything that people buy anything individual individuals or persons buy so you go buy a, uh, something buy a chocolate that contributes to gdp why does that contribute to gdp it's not something produced it's a proxy for what is being produced so when you say income approach and expense approach uh, for an individual there is an income there is an expense and then there is savings and all that but remember for if you're looking at an economy anybody's expense is somebody else's income anybody's income is somebody else's expense so just keep that in mind so anything you consume must have been produced by somebody so that's a good proxy for finding out how much is being produced so consumption is a very important idea so how much people consume underpins economy you can't indefinitely consume we know that but it's a good proxy for measuring what is created produced in the economy right so individual consumption is c what is i investment this is what companies spend to build assets what is meant by that if a company pays salary that not investment it pays salary for the watchman it's not investment so what does that happens to that money that watchman then consumes so you get computer under c remember that but if a company builds a huge factory that is investment so anything that just goes on to building an asset building something that's an investment g is government expenditure anything that the government spends on building bridges on building uh, giant dams building huge infrastructure that goes to g exports minus imports net exports exports minus imports goes into x this is what goes into computing gdp what is gdp it's some of all this now we're going to go deeper into how does some how do we stimulate the economy what is fiscal stimulus monetary stimulus what happens when you do one thing how do we increase c decrease i all of that but not now in this video we're going to keep it simple right let's go on and think about what is the other terms here when you hear about gdp and gnp gdp is within boundaries gnp is by indian nationals within india is gdp by indian nationals is gnp goes without saying gnp is stuff to compute for all practical purposes talking only about this this is not used much gdp is broken down broadly usually into three sectors this agriculture industry and services so have a look at this snapshot this just gives a snapshot for 
1990 and 2014 of India GDP. 1950 we were uh, predominantly agrarian economies, 52% agrarian. agrarian. In 2014 we are a predominantly services economy, or nearly 60% services. From an agrarian economy we become a services economy. Right? Industry has grown and then industry is now more or less flat. Agriculture has shrunk dramatically. So this is not a crisis, this is not a wrong thing, this is what all development goes towards, all countries go through this transition. We start off as agrarian, become industrial, then go to services. Right? What is agrarian? Anything agriculture, anything you produce that you eat, feed, rice, that is agrarian. Industry is hard goods, you produce television, fridge, that is industry. Services, anything where you get a service, very simple, you go get a haircut time, that's services. And very simple, these three definitions are not complicated at all. Uh, a services-led economy, if you look at more developed economies, they'll be heavily services-led. Some economies are 80% services-led. The, the industry is small, agriculture is even smaller, usually. Right? Generally, in, in countries' transition, they go from an agrarian economy to, the to an industry-led economy, then to a services-led economy. Industrial revolution underpinned this industry growth, where this segment drove growth, industry segment. In some senses, you will hear this chatter that India has bypassed the industrial revolution, the industry leading growth thing. That we were an agrarian economy, we barely uh, picked up the industrial thing, but now we are a services led economy, predominantly. So, the, 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 the idea is, is India has India bypassed this industry led growth? Do we need to go through it? Do we need to take extra effort to simulate the industrial segment? Or we are okay, services led, so be it. So, do we need to make in India an export? Do you need to make for India rather than importing these finished goods? So th those are the things that, are, that you should read about to know about it. But the broad outline, agriculture, industry, services, agrarian to begin with, services now, services light economy. GDP growth, any, there, there's a, what is called as real growth, what is nominal growth. Anytime you hear about GDP growth, we are clearly referring to real GDP growth. This is a default term. If you hear that GDP grows by 8%, that is real growth. We'll come to what is nominal. Right? If GDP growth is 5%, that is real growth, that's not nominal growth. Right? What is this nominal growth? Nominal is the actual printed number. I think to begin it broadly, if the economy is 100, value of 100 in say 2016, and it becomes 120 in 2017, this is a total value, this is a total value. So, the nominal growth is 20%. But sitting inside this 100 to 120 could be two parts. This is GDP growth and there is inflation. If you, it's like saying, I bought 5 pencils, each worth 10 rupees, 50 rupees. Then I bought 6 pencils, but now the prices have gone up. Each pencil is worth 12 rupees, 72 rupees. 5 pencils to 6 pencils is this. The price going up is one part. Going from 5 to 6 is one part. And so, it, it's a similar analogy here. You have a prices growing up playing a role and actual underlying growth playing a role. So, nominal is the actual printed value, which has two components, the real growth and inflation. So, nominal GDP real growth plus inflation is GDP nominal growth. Right? The broad theme, remember the inflation, there are many terms, we'll come to all of that later, but the fund has this, nominal growth is real GDP growth plus inflation impact. Now, actual versus PPP adjusted, PPP is purchasing power parity. What does that mean? See, let's say you have 100 rupees in India, in your wallet. Right? Now, this translates to US dollar of say about if or take 1.5, 1.6 right now. What you can do with 100 rupees, probably you cannot achieve with 1.5 dollars. It's impossible because 100 rupees is a reasonable amount of money. Uh, if, if you're saying, look, I'm not extravagant with 100 rupees, you can have practically two meals in India. But with 1.5 dollars, you can barely get a coffee in the US. And so the actual translation price is this. But if you adjust for purchasing power, what can rupees 100 fetch you is broadly what probably $4 can fetch you. And so this is the purchasing power adjustment. On this metric, a dollar is equal to rupees 25. This is the purchasing power parity adjusted GDP in dollar terms. So if the Indian economy has 
a, a, a GDP of rupees 100. In actual terms, that will translate to probably 1.5. In PPP adjusted term, it will translate to 4 dollars. So the PPP adjustment gives a sense of how many, how actually goods and services, how much, how many are being, how much is being produced in the country. So that, that's a better proxy for knowing the well-being of a country, income of a country, than dollar, the direct translation to dollar terms. Okay, so what should you know? In PPP adjusted terms, what are the top five economies? In actual dollar terms, what are the top five economies? Read that up, see that. So you'll see the difference, the role played by PPP adjustment as well. Per capita GDP is GDP by population. Very simple, there's nothing, no rocket science here. This is the truest proxy for lifestyle. A country can have a large GDP, but if it has a gigantic population, it means it's actually a poor country. So, good example, our, India has a significant GDP, India ranks high in GDP numbers, but we are not a developed nation because we have huge number of people. So because our population is so high, our per capita GDP, our lifestyle proxy is poor. And so, per capita GDP gives a good sense of how well off or how awful went or how much on an average each person in a country is earning. What factors are missed out? What does GDP not account for? Large GDP does not account for a lot of things. Right? So we're going to define, talk, talk about the top two things that we most prominently miss out on. One is sustainability. So this, this, if, if we destroy all forests and generate GDP growth, you can do that. You can just go slaughter mother nature and just go bang, 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 bang and drive growth. The number growth that year will be fabulous, but you've destroyed future growth. Right? So without caring about resources, utilizing them, then sustainability goes out. There's no way GDP accounts for this. How much of our natural resource do we deplete this year? That computation is not done at all. Right? Second thing that is missed out, which is significant, is non-monetized transactions. So you go and volunteer somewhere, that doesn't get accounted. GDP casts about the rupee value of goods and services or the dollar value of goods and services and not for the actual value created. The dollar rupee value is taken as a proxy for this. And so if a stay-at-home mom spends 10 hours making the life of her, her family fabulous or a stay-at-home dad does this, then that will not get captured in the GDP numbers. And so th that these are the two most important things that GDP does not factor in. Uh, so the GDP is a nice numerical measure, nice aggregated measure to know is the economy doing well. It's not a sufficient proxy for the well-being of a country. It's an economy, it's just one input, not the most important input or the only input. So keep that in mind. 